thank you for inviting me for the introduction. And also, I would like to thank the Foundation for bringing me to Madrid. Uh, as you mentioned in, in the introductory notes, I've, of course, uh, been quite a few times in Madrid, actually once for the whole year, thanks to Leandro Prados de la Escazura, and I was at uh, Carlos Tercero there. So first also, I would like to say that uh, um, I speak Spanish somewhat, and so that when you have questions, and I would, of course, I don't think that uh, I might need really translation, so I would, however, speak uh, in, in English, although I was once, uh, because the translator was not present, I had to, even once to give presentation in Spanish, but uh, uh, who knows what was understood from that presentation. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so uh, I am really, really very grateful for you to have come. It is uh, almost summer, it's in the, uh, you know, late in the afternoon, and I really hope to speak uh, relatively interestingly so that there is really something that you, when you go back home, you find something new that maybe you didn't know before. I would speak actually in Vicente, I would really appreciate if you let me know at 35 minutes when I am, because I would like to conclude and then obviously to open, to give more time for, for questions and answers. First of all, uh, I will speak today almost entirely about global inequality. Now I have to define the global inequality this is inequality between all citizens in the world, as if they were members of one single country. Obviously, if I were to define inequality in Spain, it would not be very difficult to understand. You would immediately know that it is inequality between all people in Spain. So their incomes in euro terms are just calculated. You take household income, divide by the number of people. There is an intuition there. But that intuition is missing because we are not really used to thinking about global inequality. That intuition is missing when we come to the global level. So uh, the definition, as I said, is actually inequality in income. It's not wealth, it's not consumption, really it's income, whatever you receive that one month or a year in, in the whole world. Technically speaking, it's like almost 7 billion people. <clears throat> Of course, in reality, you don't have the, I don't have the data for 7 billion people. What you do, and what I do, is that actually I get data from household surveys that are representative for individual countries. So then I combine them, and then I apply to the household incomes, I apply uh, what is called purchasing power parity, or simply the price levels of different countries, to adjust for the fact that obviously things in India are less expensive than in Spain or that Spain is less expensive than Norway. Because if you don't do that, then of course you would underestimate real incomes or real purchasing power of people who live in poor countries where the price level is lower. <clears throat> so let me then, how am I going to approach that and explain what is interesting there? I could go directly into the sort of explaining what happened to the global inequality, but I prefer to take a little bit an indirect approach. So what I would do first is to re review things that many of you already know, which is what happened to inequalities within countries, and then I would actually like to say something what happened to inequalities between countries, like country gaps, <coughs> differences in mean income between, for example, Spain and Morocco, US and Mexico, and so forth, and then to unify all of that into what happened to global inequality. So this is the, the idea. <coughs> now, <coughs> excuse me for that. Now, <coughs> it also happens that it's actually convenient because if you take global inequality, you can divide it into two parts, inequality between, uh, between the countries, and inequality within countries, where actually, as I said before, you only basically focus on inequality between uh, everybody in Spain, everybody in, in England, everybody in the US, and you somehow add them up. So let's go and see really what happened first to inequalities within nations, things that you already know, really, which basically you, there is so much in the press that you know it. Let's see if I, have, if I can get this to work. <coughs> which one? Let me see. Ah, okay. Okay, well, let's see. Yes, it is working. Okay, so we know that inequalities 
within individual countries mostly increased over the last 25 to 30 years. I'm going to speak about a period of 25 to 30 years. To make it very kind of intuitively clear, I would speak of the period around from the mid-80s or the fall of the Berlin Wall essentially to the period up to 2011. My latest data are from 2011. So they mostly increased. <clears throat> Here is, you know, you can, I'm not going to read all the slides. You can see the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality. The Gini coefficient goes up. When the Gini coefficient goes up, inequality goes up. And as you can see, in the period of the late 80s, uh, compared to about the time when I did my dissertation, to today, inequality generally went up. Not everywhere. You know, South America, Brazil is an exception, and then Mexico and Argentina as well. But, you know, all other countries, if you look OECD countries, not huge increases, but still significant, you know, noticeable increases. Then U.S., U.K., um, uh, Sweden, for example, a country which is very egalitarian, but still had an increase. And then China, India, somewhat less, Russia. So basically, in most of the world, you had this increase. I've now divided countries differently with, if you weigh them by the population, as you will see that in a second, I will show you this slide. This is the same idea about the Gini coefficients. Uh, and with the horizontal axis, you have the value in 1988, vertical axis value in 2008 and afterwards. And if the, if the dots are above this line, then it means that there was an increase in inequality. Remember, Gini measures inequality, not equality, but inequality. Uh, and then, of course, you see countries, for statistical reasons, I divide China into rural and urban, and you see there are really very big dots, because obviously, you know, uh, urban China now has about 600 million people. It had about, you know, 500 million in the beginning of the period. And then urban India, uh, rural India, NGA is Nigeria. And, of course, the countries at the very top, the countries with very high income inequality, like Brazil and Mexico, which do show the decline. So they are actually unusual in this. What is also interesting is that, as you know, there are countries with very high inequality. So the countries among the most unequal in the world, and they show a decline. So that was basically the story. <clears throat> For some of the graduate students who are in search of a topic for dissertation, I, that's why I have for them this slide, I don't have an answer, but you know, when you look at these countries, put them together, what happened between 1988 and 2010 or 11, you notice that there was a certain amount of convergence in the Gini coefficients, meaning they have become more similar. Uh, I don't have an explanation. It could be the effects of globalization. It could be the effect of the fact that you really cannot now have very independent economic policies between the countries. It could be simply an artifact of the data because countries with low inequality, maybe you cannot read them, but countries with low inequality in 1988, like Eastern European countries, had a large increase in inequality. And countries with high inequality, like Latin America, had a decline. But nevertheless, it's an interesting phenomenon, and for those who study macroeconomics, uh, they might actually think that we generally believe that there is convergence in mean incomes, uh, which is the first moment of the distribution, and really inequality is the second moment of distribution. So maybe there is some convergence in, in, in that second moment. But I will not go into all these you know, more speculative or technical aspects. I just wanted to, to show you this slide. Uh, if you also then plot the same Gini coefficients against GDP per capita, you get a graph like that where I actually highlighted three groups of countries. The blue countries are the rich countries, the advanced countries. There, if you look at them, you will notice an outli two outliers, basically. Uh, U.S. with very high inequality compared to its own peers, other rich countries, and Israel as well with high inequality. Uh, then the red countries are formerly communist countries, uh, which span large, uh, they're very, uh, you know, different in level of income. You have relatively poor countries like Kyrgyzstan, and then you have countries like uh, Slovenia or, or Czech Republic. But as you can see, they are still relatively equal. There are some exceptions, like Russia, but the others, Central European countries, for example, are still below the OECD average. So it's not, 
of the inequality went up in all uh, transition countries, formerly transition countries, uh, they have not, it is generally felt that they have all followed and become like Russia, but they have not. And the third group are the green countries, it's Latin America. And then, of course, you see that these countries tend to be relatively unequal at their level of income. Another group of countries that they did not, because there are too many colors there, that they did not want to single out, and where our data are not really particularly good, are African countries. So African countries tend for their income level to really have very high inequality. Uh, I think also look at this graph for a minute, because I, I really would like you to focus on the fact that while we tend in rich countries to really think essentially in Spain to think of France, Germany, maybe US, you realize there that rich countries are relatively overall equal. It's, in other words, when you compare you know, the Gini, which is on the vertical axis, they are really towards the bottom of the Gini. As I said before, their inequality has gone up, but they are still, globally speaking, they are still relatively, relatively equal. Um, now, I want here to uh, sort of emphasize one interesting point on which maybe during the question and answers I will have to say a little bit more. I would like to kind of show you, this is based on Luxembourg income study data, uh, show, oh, these are micro data from individual country statistical offices, which are harmonized, so the definitions are the same. I want to show you like what it seems to have happened in, during the the most recent period of these 25 or 30 years of increased inequality. Now, look at the first line, which is, I hope you can see it, it is the red line on the top for the US and Germany. That line shows you inequality, and you see it's rising over time. Horizontal line is time. So it's rising over time, but that's inequality before government redistribution. In other words, it is inequality or what we call market inequality or factor income inequality. So it's before government transfers or before government taxes. So notice that both in Germany and the US, that line went up very strongly. Up. Went up strongly. Uh, and reached about the same level. You might not read it, but it's very high gene of about 0.5 or 50 if you you know define it in percentage terms. But then focus quickly, immediately, on the blue line, which is the thick line on the bottom. And this is inequality of disposable income. And what I think is clear, in, even in a sort of simple uh, picture like this, is that while in Germany the red line went up, like in the US, and actually more sharply than the US, the offsetting effect of government transfers and taxes was sufficient to actually keep the blue line increasing a little bit, but not very much. In other words, if the market Gini went up by 10 points, the disposable income Gini went up by, I suppose, two points. But in the US, the disposable income Gini, the blue line, really more or less followed the red line. So in other words, the redistributive function of the government was more or less as it was before. In other words, did not really offset the increase in inequality. I want to mention that also because I believe, but I will not expand on that, I believe that in the future, particularly in the rich countries, uh, we or one should actually think much more about how to make this red line be less sort of high or how to bring down that uh, red line so that one does not have to have a huge government redistribution to come to a relatively low blue line of disposable income. In other words, how to equalize assets, education, and ownership of property to make uh, people who enter the process actually more equal at the starting position. Now, I did this afternoon actually the same graph for Spain and Germany. Now, what is interesting there, and of course, many of you know that much better than I, I just sort of did this graph this afternoon, is that actually for Spain, you don't have, there is like some of the CISO movement, but you don't see, you, there is an increase overall or in the blue line, but it's not nearly as dramatic as it is in, in uh, Germany. 
I think it's a good topic. I, as I said, I don't know what is the background of that, but clearly we noticed an increase in the blue line, but much less than in Germany. And then when it comes to the, to the uh, actually in this case, disposable, I'm sorry, I transported the, the colors. In this case, the disposable income is, is green. You see actually in Spain, basically stagnation of inequality. The last number here is 2010. What I've, when I was at a conference in Valencia a week ago, I understand that actually 2013 number is significantly like two Gini points higher. So maybe that end point for Spain should be higher, but you don't see very big sort of a change there. You don't even see that the government has become more redistributive. Actually, if you look at this graph and maybe disregard this strange movements of up and down, you would see a relative stability, both in the market income inequality and in the disposable income inequality. So this is something, I, as I said, I think actually maybe topic for another research. Uh, and part of that is in the OECD report also, which just was issued recently. But the, that difference between market income, uh, which is before taxes and transfers, and the ultimate disposable income, which takes into account government transfers and taxes, Although if you want to go even further, which I don't do here, you should also take into account government uh, indirect taxation, because obviously the effects of indirect taxation like VAT are not you know, the same across the, the distribution. So, you know, these are the, you know, I just listed here some of the issues that we now sort of very often mention in regard to inequality within nations. Uh, I will not go over them except to say that one interesting topic, which I think is a uh, rising topic, is that uh, focus on the so-called hidden assets of the rich. Of course, these assets produce income. Uh, this is recent work by uh, Gabriel Zuckman, and it is remarkable that actually he finds that something up to between 8 and 9 percent of all global financial assets are held in different tax havens. Now, why I mention that? Uh, because th these amounts are obviously not included in household survey data that I'm going to show you in a minute, simply because if people actually keep their assets to escape uh, taxation, they are not very likely to you know, give me infor give us information when we do household surveys. So we are actually more aware than before that there may be an underestimation of inequality because of our imperfect ability in household surveys to capture the very top 1%. Now, uh, I will not uh, just, I will not talk very much about the rest. I just would like to show the long-term evolution of inequality. Uh, here I could have also chosen Spanish data that actually I use very much from, from Leandra's work, but I had uh, uh, English, I mean UK and uh, uh, US data simply because they are in some sense more paradigmic for the development of the Kuznets curve and what I call the Kuznets and Piketty frame. Now the first thing actually this goes back to something 1688 in the case of UK, of England, in the case of the United States 7074. So I wanted to show you here is that, uh, that the peak of inequality is believed to have taken place towards the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. And then we had this really great, you know, great leveling from World War I to 1980, or differently great leveling during the short, so-called short 20th century. And this was the typical idea that economists had in mind, people who work on inequality, so-called Kuznets curve, that there would be an increase in inequality and a decline. Now, more recently, with the, and this would be like that kind of Kuznets frame, but more recently with the work of Piketty, we now have a little bit of a different frame on the same data. And now it is really not inverted U, but it's a U-shaped frame. Now, the interpretations are very different. The interpretation of Kuznets was, until we had this problem with increasing inequality in rich countries, the interpretation of Kuznets was that inequality increases in the beginning of development with increased GDP per capita, and then it reaches a peak, and then there is sort of a positive or optimistic message that eventually 
driven by education, rising education amongst people, driven by a lower importance of capital income, by greater demand for social transfers, it would go down. Well, of course, the Piketty's uh, message is different and less optimistic because the increase of inequality which we see there, if you extend it into the future, uh, seems more and more like 19th century. And then from a graph like that, the great leveling, that part where the curve, go, curve goes down, appears as an anomaly as an anomaly driven by war, hyperinflation, socialism, strong communist parties, and so forth. There is a guy actually recently sent me a paper, Brazilian uh, uh, researcher, who actually has a sort of empirical model, which is interesting. Of course, I, you cannot believe it's like a single factor, but he actually believe, sort of puts the, so the distance from the Soviet Union and military spending as in the uh, sort of a factors reducing inequality. In other words, during the grand, uh, great leveling. In other words, if you were close to the Soviet Union, you actually had to have low inequality because you were afraid that the workers actually are going to be uh, to rebel or to actually support socialists or some kind of redistribution. So clearly, then that period is an anomalous period. So the interpretations based on the same data, as you can see, can be if not radically different, but significantly different. Uh, now, let me then move to the second part of global inequality, which is between, inequality, between nations. That, again, is something that, of course, most of us know. We don't need really to be told much about that. You can actually see every day, particularly Spain, which became a hugely recipient country, with lots of people coming from Latin America, from Africa, from Eastern Europe, countries with lower income level to Spain to realize that, of course, between national inequalities are very high. So I want to show you the graph that actually I very often use, uh, which I think illustrates that quite dramatically. And what you see on the graph is that if you look at the horizontal axis, it is percentiles from the number one, which is the poorest, to the number 100, which is the richest. <clears throat> And you essentially take somebody's household income, find them in their own country's income distribution. So, for example, let's suppose, I don't know sure if this is going to work, so I'm afraid to push the button to, to highlight because I'm afraid what will happen. But uh, uh, let me see. If, oh, no, you see, that's what I was afraid. Yeah, okay, let me just. So you take a position on the, on, uh, of the let's suppose, 50th percentile in the U.S., and then this would be on the horizontal axis, and then you draw the line and say, where is that person in the global income distribution? And this would, you would read on the vertical axis, you would read something like 90th percentile. So in other words, a person who is in the middle of the US income distribution would be, a pers would be in the world at uh, like 91st maybe percentile. It's not kind of, when you think of it, not kind of surprising, if you're in the middle of the Norwegian or Danish income distribution, you're also going to be at the 90th percentile. Of course, what is interesting that if you're at the very bottom of the U.S. income distribution, like here, you're still above the 50th percentile in the world. So you're better off than half of the world population. Then you actually plot against that country like India, where I know the numbers are underestimated because also the, the, the size of each percentile in India is 12 million people. So in order for them to be in the top 1%, you would have to really have like whole, whole Bombay really very rich. You don't have that many very rich people in India. Nevertheless, I think they're very indicative because you can see that people who are actually middle class in India, let's say people who are at 50th, 60th percentile, are only about the 30th percentile in the world. So, of course, at every point of the income distribution, people in the U.S. are much better off and much richer, which we know. But we also look at this gap, how it varies at different points of the distribution. You can do the same graph for, with actual incomes. But, uh, you know, the, the problem with doing it with actual incomes is that the, the differences in incomes in the world are so big that if I were to put this graph, 
with actual incomes, you would practically see nothing because you would see United States being only like hugging the ceiling of this graph and African countries and India being really on the floor. So really, because the gaps are so big, then I have to put it in, in logarithmic terms, but then, you know, until you explain logarithmic terms, and actually even I don't really feel logarithmic sort of comfortable, I think this is, I think, a better way to do it. So then, let me just go very quickly over some countries. China, which is 2008, for 2011, Chinese numbers, which now I have for rural and urban, would be actually higher than what I have here. So you already see that the Chinese middle class or upper middle class is about the world's 80th percentile, 90th percentile. So really, and we are talking about lots of people. Each dot for China is 13 million people. You know, each dot for the United States is only 3 million people. So uh, a big difference. Now, of course, you also see for China that the very poor people in China are equally poor like poor people in India or at the bottom 1%. Then I have here Russia, where you also see that a substantial middle class has appeared around the, the 80th and 90th percentile. And you know, it's not driven by the oligarchs because they are not in this survey. They are no more in that survey that they are, you know, you know Bill Gates is not in the American survey, nor is, you know, uh, Carlos Slim in the Mexican survey. And finally, I want to show you this country, I will not give you immediately the name, but I would like you to think a little bit. Uh, it's a country that actually spans the world, and it really mimics the world. You have there, if you look, you have there people who are really among the poorest percentiles in the world. You have people who are in the middle. You have substantial middle class, 80th, 90th, 93rd percentile, and you have them also in the global top 1%. And, of course, that country is Brazil. Uh, another possibility would be South Africa. It's really the countries that are almost, they are not as unequal as the world, but they're getting pretty close to mimicking the world inequality. Because within themselves, which is not very common, they contain a very poor people, like really globally poor. People who are like one or two dollars or three dollars, we really cannot tell the difference there, is, it's so small per day, and people who are in a global top 1%. Now, in the European countries, you're not going to see that. Let me just, before I move to that, let me just show you this dramatic graph, which illustrates Denmark and a number of African countries. Uh, the advantage of these slides, I believe, is that whereas in the uh, normal kind of GDP comparison, we of course know that Denmark is... I don't know, Denmark probably now has something like $50,000 in PPP terms, and many African countries might have 500 or, you know, 700. So we are talking about the ratio of, you know, 80 to 1. We know that Denmark is much richer. But when you look at the fact that practically everybody in Denmark, statistically, is richer than everybody in Mali or Tanzania or Mozambique, that, I think, is more striking because you have essentially two distributions that in statistical terms really don't touch each other. They don't, they don't overlap. And I will not sort of go into that whole area of which I'm actually now working more, on which I'm working more than before, but clearly if you look at this graph, it immediately asks the question in your mind, is, is migration sort of a result of huge differences in mean country income? I'm not talking here about migration or refugees that are driven by wars. I'm talking about people who are actually realizing that they can increase their income, you know, by 10, 20 or more times simply by migrating to a, a much richer country. Even if that richer country, they are, end up at the bottom of the income distribution. Now, I did also Spain in a global context, and I wanted to put Spain here against, obviously, Germany, as you can see, Germany, except for the very top, dominates Spain. In other words, uh, at, if you take people at the given percentile of the distribution, Germans are better off. Uh, by the way, the Spanish point at the, at the bottom is very similar to the American point in the bottom. So, you know, uh, but as you can see in Germany or later, I mean, I showed before Denmark, these people at the bottom are uh, significantly higher. And then I have here Argentina and Mexico for obvious reasons, cultural and migration, uh, with, of course, Argentina and Mexico having also people at the very bottom, 
in the world. You don't have, as I mentioned before, you don't have in Europe that uh, the bottom of national income distributions going very deep down. It stays at around medium globally. And then I put the Ivory Coast, which is, I think, obviously illustrates that even the middle class in those countries is much, much worse off, much poorer than, than people in Spain. Um, I, I just also, uh, today when I was doing that, I, I didn't bring this slide because really you, you cannot see very much, but I did a slide with several other countries, with Portugal, uh, Greece, and so on. And what, I, what is actually interesting there, uh, believe me, although the slide is not there, is that really you cannot distinguish this, I mean, we are talking really about putting that in a global framework. Basically, uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy it are very, very similar in the distributions. Really, it's not nothing like what I showed you before that you can see really dramatic differences. So the EU 15, in many respects, has lots of overlaps. Although, of course, we know that some countries are richer than the others. From the global perspective, these differences are relatively small. With EU 28, it's a little bit different because, of course, the differences there are, are larger. Now, this is simply I want to illustrate the, the percentage of people of countries that have more than 1% of their population in the global top 1%. Uh, U.S. there has, you know, 12% of the people uh, in the United States are the global top 1%. I think Spain must be, it's not here on the list, so it must be with one per, top global, uh, Spanish top 1% is part of the global top 1%. Uh, you know, that opens up a little bit the issue of, of what, is, uh, uh, what is top 1%. Because when you look at the demonstrations and sort of general way of thinking, we think of global top 1% nationally. But you know, if 12% of Americans are part of the global top 1%, you know, it's, it changes a little bit your approach. You might be not top 1% of your country and believe that these guys who are richer than you should have less, but you may at the same time be part of the global top 1%. Because to be global top 1%, you need less money than to be top 1% in Spain or the United States. So now I want to skip to the global inequality. And if I could ask uh, Vicente, actually, how many minutes do I still have? Because I, I, this part, I can actually f be very flexible on that. Because I have to, to, to go quickly over this. Uh, do I have 5 or 10? Do I have 5 or 10? Ten, or ten. Okay, so let me then introduce this part, which is actually sort of a combination of the two. Uh, first, to show by, that uh, these are the coverage by population of the service. So, as you can see, different regions of the world. I'm covering more than ninety percent of the population. These are unmanipulated data. Uh, they they are definitions of income or consumption as they come. I don't impose anything on, on them, other than what I said before, I simply convert it into international dollars. But it is not like what some people do, it is not some kind of synthetic indicator, it does not impose a distribution, it doesn't impose log normal or any distribution, it is just recorded per capita incomes, household per capita incomes. And one thing which is also clear here is that Africa in this data is underrepresented and because it's a poor continent we actually tend to underestimate uh, global inequality. Now I want to go to move to the to give you an intuitive feeling about how <coughs> to think about global inequality because it is essentially driven by three forces. It is driven by the force of, of what happens with inequalities within nations what I just talked about. So you can say, oh, well, over the last 25, 30 years, they generally went up. So that should push, you know, global inequality up. Then you, oh, I'm sorry, oh, it's not the, oh, it's not the, the right slide. Uh, uh, let me see, where is that, the, intu the intuitive slide. Yeah, uh, sorry, this is the intuitive slide. So the first question you ask, <clears throat> what happens to within national income inequalities? As I said, you basically say, okay, they went up, so it must push global inequality up. 
if you look the second question, what happens to the convergence of incomes between poor and rich countries? And there, until about 2000, year 2000, you had actually increasing divergence because Africa, Eastern Europe, and Latin America had a fairly bad period, whereas the rich countries had a good period. After 2000, and especially after the crisis, during the crisis, the convergence has actually continued, or actually become stronger, because countries in Asia, Latin America, and Africa continued growing at 4 or 5% per year, whereas Europe had almost zero, or sometimes negative growth. But the last point is, the, for intuition, the most important, is actually what happens to the average incomes of poor and very populous countries, like China and India. Because, as I said to my students often, if you exclude China, you actually have an increase in global inequality up to the year 2000. So China and India are like two big sumo wrestlers that are really fighting global inequality, because they are really the most important forces keeping global inequality in check, then curbing its increase, and now, for the first time maybe in maybe century and a half, starting a decline in global inequality. So it is a momentous event, and its momentous event is driven by what happened with really, with fast growth in poor and very big countries like China and India. Now, of course, they are not the only ones, in Asia, we have other countries with Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, also growing very fast. So these are really forces that drive global inequality down. So the, before I show the one last slide, I just wanted to say that when you do all these calculations, you find that global inequality, the Gini, the one that I talked about before, is at the level of approximately 70 points. It has gone up from 1988 to probably 1998 approximately, and then it started going down, and from, I think, year 2000, every time that we have measured that, it has been slightly lower. Uh, remember, however, that there was a qualification or the caveat that it could be that we are mismeasuring the top incomes, so maybe the decline is not as I believe two or three points, maybe the decline is only one or one and a half point, but clearly we do have a decline. However, and that I would like to show as my last slide and leave then the questions, there are lots of slides here that I have to, to skip. Some of them are fairly technical, so I don't think you have lost very much on that. So I want to show this slide, which shows the very pattern of that decline in equality and who was the winner and who was, to some extent, a loser of globalization over the last 25 years. It's a very unusual graph, even in the shape, but let me explain what it means. In the, on the horizontal axis, you have uh, people in the global income distribution by their percentile. So the people at, at the number one are the poorest people in the world, actually the poorest 5%, then the second poorest 5%, and so on, all the way to the to the richest uh, 5 and 1%. On the vertical axis, you have the rate of increase in their real income over the period of, in this case, 20 years, from 1988 to 2008. The graph is more or less the same to 2011, but this one is actually, I think, somewhat more dramatic. So what you notice here is that, actually, this is the area where you had largest percentage gains, like almost doubling of real incomes. So these are people around the middle of the income distribution. And what, from what I've already said before, I'm sure that many of you already know who is likely to be there, is what I called, under quotes, China's middle class. <laughs> it is really basically people from the middle and the upper parts of the income distributions in Asian countries. So it's not only China, but it's all obviously, you know, countries, I mean, other countries like, you know, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, India, so forth. Then you notice that particular situation here, that you have people around the fairly well off, around the 80th percentile of the world income distribution, but with zero re real growth. Now, these people, of course, you would have guessed also who they are, 
I call them the US lower middle class, but it's really essentially OECD countries, rich OECD countries. 72% uh, of people in that, on that point, around that point, it's not one point, it's just around there, you're talking about you know, something like maybe 8 or 10% of the population of the world, are people from uh, old OECD or, or rich OECD countries. Especially three stand out because they are large countries. It is uh, US, Japan, and Germany. <coughs> people forget that Germany actually in the bottom half of the income distribution had very few, little growth in real incomes. The wages were stagnant. So uh, Germany also belongs to that category of absence of growth. And then the last group is really people who are in top 1%. And these are, of course, people who had also very good period and whose, whose real, income, real incomes have also doubled. So if you look at these three points, actually, and I call them points A, B, and C, uh, with A being the first with, you know, what they call the China middle class, I think that actually they illustrate very well also the political issues, and this is where I will finish my, my talk today, uh, political issues in the next, you know, in, which happened during the last 25 years, and I believe which way await us in the next 25 years. And these are, first, for China, is really the accommodation of the rising domestic middle class. A greater participation, demand for new services, possibly demand for social transfers, and maybe demands for the change in the political uh, system. The point B, in my opinion, illustrates Problems, <coughs> excuse me, problems of democracy in rich, advanced nations where you have a large segment of the bottom uh, of relatively poor people nationally but well off globally who have had no growth. So in other words, you ask the question, what kind of adjustments there will be in the democratic system to actually accommodate that absence of growth? Because you can assume or imagine that in the next 25 years, with new Asian or African countries coming into the globalization, these people's incomes are not going to go up either. So really, can 50 years of absence of growth be compatible with maintenance of democratic institutions as we know them today? Uh, I think it's a question that one has to address. And finally, the last point uh, really illustrates the rising political and economic power of some kind of a global elite, which is relatively small in numbers, but actually become, is becoming economically much more powerful and might actually have its own agenda. So in that sense, actually, when I said the title of the presentation is the evolution of global inequality or trends in global inequality and their political implications, this is what I meant by the political implications. So thank you very much for your attention.